Welcome to the Anatomy of a Strategy podcast. This is Carlos Pacheco. And my name is Tara Hunt. And this week we have another special guest. This is actually um, in the history of our podcast series so far as our first ever client guest. Yes. And don't worry, we're not putting our clients on here because we want to somehow promote what they're doing. We actually just think that Heather is so smart. So who we have today is Heather Ritchie in the studio. She has been um, working in global high-tech companies for several years, and she is dedicated to building pipelines of women leaders. She also did a four-year research project on how leaders will need to communicate in a world that's increasingly diverse, collaborative, and filled with intelligent machines. So she is uh, exploring the limits of AI and automation into the future. And she has some very optimistic lessons to um, deliver to us. Yes, it will be a very interesting conversation. So let's get started. I am so excited to have Heather Ritchie, from Head of Campaign Strategy at Nokia, sitting here in our studio in person, live in person. I always <laughs> love that today. Welcome. It is a pleasure to be here. I always love coming down and hanging out with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, we would love you to come down anytime. Um, uh, you bring such great conversations. And that's essentially why we wanted to bring you in and have you on the podcast is because we've had some like these amazing juicy conversations. And at one point <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, we've got to record this. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't really have like a super agenda or a, or a list of questions uh, other than like really just talking about the things that I find really interesting about what we've talked about previously. And some of it is is around um, because you're at Nokia, uh, you've had all this progressive uh, experience at these big companies. You've been able to see inside these organizations and especially a company as old as Nokia over like well over 100 years old and how it is evolved over the years and evolved to keep up with a very changing landscape, changing consumer and, a, a, you know, changing amount of technology, changing amount of strategies that you could potentially um, uh, adopt with an organization. Um, and so looking at that internally, but also you're doing some of your own really cool work. So we'll get into that um, as well. But just to begin, um, tell us a little bit for people that don't already follow you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your history and what got you here today. So I come from a communications background and I've worked at small agencies and I've worked at startups, but I've also done some work at big multinationals and most recently with, with Nokia. And the interesting thing about working with Nokia and really working in, in telecom is the degree of reinvention that's gone on. These are businesses that are completely changed from what they were 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the process to get there, when you take a look at, you know, uh, retooling of staff, refreshing of staff, taking a look at what you emphasize on business, you take a look at one technology generation ends and a new one begins. It's really cemented in me the importance of mindset and ability to learn. And that's what we bring into to marketing. Nokia has gone through some pretty major changes on the marketing side over the last year and a half. We've been a company that absolutely loves our products. We love tech, and that's what we talked about predominantly. But now we're switching to a more audience-centric approach, which is really taking a look at how do we help our audience, giving them information that they need to make some strategic decisions. And it may sound like fairly basic, but the mechanics that go behind it and the operational side of the equation is actually fairly complex. Yeah. And that's what, what I love about that and, and why that's music to my ears. And when we first met, I was like, this is working with you guys going forward is the dream come true is because of how focused you were on really helping your audience achieve what they needed to achieve rather than, okay, we need to sell more 
stuff. Yeah, I mean, and here's all, how it works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I mean, ultimately, you will sell more stuff because of it, because your audience will build that relationship and grow to trust you. Um, and I think that's like uh, really interesting. I would love to hear a little bit about how you got to that place, because when you came into Nokia, were they already on that route? Or is that something that you've been part of working on um, in your role there? No, Nokia was a lot like I came from from Alcatel Lucent, uh, which is another large hundred plus year old telecom company, and then into into Nokia, and Nokia was very much technology and product centric as as well. And I think that you know when you take a look at that reinvention process, that you start to realize that our customers have changed pretty dramatically. I think there's a stat out that says 57%, they get 57% of the way through a buying cycle before they pick up the phone to call. Mm-hmm. Um, we And they aren't necessarily looking, or they are looking, but it's a lot later in a buying cycle about how technology works. And so we weren't really being efficient about attracting new customers, coming in early at the the, the buying center. And certainly, and I think that this is probably the most important thing if 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 someone's out there looking at marketing and marketing strategy, is that long-term focus on product-centric marketing without a balance on the thought leadership side really starts to show up in your market positions and thought leadership positions. And we started to see that across brand studies, um, competitive positioning and whatnot. People like the technology, but on the thought leadership side, you know, we had paid a price. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is switching our marketing to adjust to some of those issues. Because certainly when you come into big technology transitions like 5G, we've got a team of really smart people that are very thoughtful about the approach. But the point is, is about making sure that that's communicated Mm -hmm. in a way that really helps our customers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, even when we started uh, talking, I was uh, really amazed at how reflective um, you guys were on that whole side of just like understanding and being very honest about where your customers had gone and where they were at and like how you weren't you you had you had sort of fallen behind where they needed to be and that you were making all of these amazing adjustments like I think probably one of the biggest questions that people will have when they're listening to this is okay so that's a great insight how did you sell that like up mm-hmm. to the <laughs> to the powers that be to sign off on that adjustment away from being product centric to audience centric. Well, I think it was a, a position that the organization was coming to. Okay, that you know after and and I'm just going to be very pragmatic about it. When you're running a marketing organization and you're going through a you know profitability and budget cuts and and a whole bunch of issues like that you have to stand back and take a look at how efficient and effective is my organization and you're asking a lot of operational questions and so for us big multinational you know with multiple product lines you know 140 countries we started spreading our budget and resources really thin, you know, kind of a peanut butter strategy. Mm -hmm. So you could do a whole bunch of little things, but the big things that actually make an impact were out of reach. We just weren't set up to get some of that stuff done. And I was talking to someone this morning, he was talking about working with someone in Canada where their budget is just Canadian and it's a small chunk and unable to do um, some big things. And I think we realized as an organization that we just weren't being as effective as we could be. We weren't using our dollars the way that we should be. We weren't really covering a full um, sales cycle for uh, for our salespeople and for our customers. And there was just, a, we had to make some really big changes. And so organizationally, we went through like head to toe reorg, the way we cut our budgets, the way that we organized, and we went whole hog instead of doing like small little pilots, right? We made a, a decision to go painful, but, you know, all in. Ripped the band-aid off. <laughs> we did, we did. And for an organization our size, right, the first year was was a little bit hard. You felt like you were kind of tripping over each other to learn a methodology. Mm-hmm. In software, you know, our team you know, uses an agile process to get things out the door. It's a fairly well-documented process, set of tools that folks are using. And it takes a little while for R&D teams to figure that out and switch to that mode of working. We did essentially the same thing with marketing. We switched to a, a model from serious decisions where there's a real methodology and a process for how you develop a campaign, how you do your research, and how you take it out the door. Yeah. 
the um, you know I'm really very surprised like every time we um, we ha- like we have a conversation and then the organization is so open to be like okay well we should we should open up this conversation to you know your other agency partners or people like in inter- other uh, business units internally because you know for you to think uh, you know, what we were used to is people thinking very um, uh, what do you call Silos. that? Siloed, yeah. yeah. Uh, in that, like, no, we keep this here in this decision, and this this is what we're measuring in this like very specific way. Whereas every time we talk to you about an idea or thinking through something, you guys open up this amazing cross um, cross department, uh, cross uh, agency, uh, agency yeah. discussion. Which I find makes – like a lot of the people I think think is going to slow it down, right? Oh, we have more cooks in the kitchen. But I actually have found just through working on that, like for instance, the working with your PR agency as well as your internal PR team when it comes to the content and the feedback around that by opening that up we have streamlined this amazing process where we can get instant feedback from them. They can make requests for like future articles or, hey, can we use this for this pitch and all that sort of thing, um, which has like almost sped up the process. And I have never seen that in an organization is that it's really actually very, um, it's, it's, it's very refreshing to work with. We've worked with several organizations that are not nearly as big as Nokia, where... Um, it's been like, we were like, oh, could we talk to your SEO firm because we want to make sure that we're working together because we're doing content, right? Content and SEO, they go together mm-hmm. like very tightly. We're doing content. We'd like to talk with, oh, no, you can't, you know, that's that's there, that's the department there and you're the department there. <laughs> and it's like, doesn't make a lot of sense, but you already, I mean, you, you're looking at me right now like, well, why wouldn't? Week. <laughs> well, no, no. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear it because yeah. with big organizations, like, I mean, I'd love to stand up and say we're like the most efficient machine in town. But I think that some of that stuff comes down to the structural change of you run everything out of a campaign. And when we reorganized, right, we made it really clear that we're building around campaigns. So our SEO team right. supports the campaign, right? And they're, you know, they're designed to do that. When we come on out to the field team, right, it's designed to support the campaign. So we're pretty clear about where decisions get made. And I think that that's the the key to success, right? We can go and do all of those things, but where the decisions get made, that's not a huge team. We try to keep that as small and tight as, as possible because, you know, otherwise you've got 14 people on a call and everyone's right. got a point of view. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll chime in like with a specific question. Do you think that 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 change that, that the way you guys have been sort of able to do that as well as also because of you know the type of people that you hire you know internally to be you know we're we're, we're in a world where agencies are constantly in this thing where clients are bringing work in house and all, all that sort of stuff and then people are you know much more advanced internally marketing wise or thinking wise right whereas you know I've had experiences again like. 10 years ago when, you know, the client doesn't know much about marketing mm-hmm. and you're sort of giving them their Coles notes of everything. And now when we have a conversation, it's like, wow, the client knows us, you know, yeah. really a lot. We have insights as well, but I feel like, you know, uh, things have improved on that side as well yeah. in terms of like people bringing really qualified marketers in house that understand that everything needs to happen together or needs to communicate together. Yeah. And that goes to part of the skill refresh that's needed, right? And the reinvention. And I would say that we're, you know, in process of doing that at Nokia. You know, when you take a look at, you know, big corporations, you tend to have people who've been there for a long time doing jobs in the same way that they've always done jobs. And you know what? They do it really well, but then everything changes. And it's really interesting watching this process um, how many people are quick to adapt and how many people are, are resistant, right? Because you get, you get a mix. Mm-hmm. But we've been making a really conscious effort to try to bring in digital s- tool kits. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's cool. Over the last few weeks, I've been, I've been interviewing, I'm getting asked to 
screen some candidates. You know, we're looking at more data scientists. I think you get a chance to work with Zoltan, one of the guys on our team who's mm-hmm. just is phenomenal at the analytics side. So we're definitely making a conscious decision to try to change the skills, bringing them in. At even training, and the amount of training that I've gone through in the last year and a half to get us ready and into the new model and new way of doing things is something that I haven't seen in a long time. And a lot of that stuff is mandatory. Right. You know, everyone in the marketing team had 40 hours of mandatory online classes that they had to complete last year. Wow. It You know, it's a major commitment. And yeah. then for the folks who are running strategy and whatnot, we've been going through multiple workshops and, you know, to get people on board with advisors who are taking a look in and out of the campaign. So from a learning perspective, it's been absolutely huge. Now, that said... Right. We're trying to upscale our team, but we're also realizing, and I think that this is the world we live in, that we would be smoking crack if we thought that we would be (laughs) like, you know, perfect at doing everything. So we are pretty picky about the partners that we choose to work with. Mm -hmm. And my philosophy is, you know, as much as, um, you know, we've got to be in that constant learning mode, you have to pair with people who are going to teach you something. And I think the first time we sat down at our table together, and you and I have had several calls where places where I was not sure and I was feeling a little uneasy, where it's just explain this to me. Right. Walk me through the strategy. Taking a look at deep research to come up and make decisions. Um, and that's really important part of building the team inside and outside. Yeah, yeah I found like over the over the years... I am a, well, I guess, for lack of a better term, a cowboy when it comes to this stuff. Right? And a bit of a geek, I must say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely a geek and a cowboy. Like, I'm that person who will rock the boat, not because I want to be, like, a ro- boat rocker, but mm. because the way that I look at the world is very scrappy. I come from that community. Like, I come from a cultural studies critical thinking, unpacking, asking why kind of point of view into my career. And so I've had to learn over the years that uh, that I'm not always talking the same language as my clients. So sometimes, which is great. Yeah, which is great, but it could also create problems, right? For many years, I was like, why aren't they? Like I'd work with people and then I'd be like, oh, but I, I guess you didn't understand what I was what I just said to you and then I realized it was because um, like it's a cultural thing the the language is different that you're using to describe the same thing so big organizations have a very different language and every big organization every industry has a different language and small organizations um, even in different industries have different languages. Like you could say, uh, you know, even in marketing terms. So for instance, you can say conversion Mm -hmm. and it means something different to everybody. And it doesn't always just mean a sale or it doesn't mean like what you think it means. It comes back to the princess bride. I do not think you mean what you do. (laughs) I love that movie. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But it's so true that... You know, and I've had to learn a lot um, over the years. And what I really, you know, what I've really appreciated over the last um, uh, several months of working uh, with you guys is how much I've learned about, like, the language and the way that campaigns work. I would love to actually have you talk a little bit about how you guys come to a campaign and maybe talk a little bit because this is the digital, you're in the sort of the digital time Mm-hmm. Era, so what does that mean, and how how did how do you come to something like digital time? Well, so it starts with the audience, right? Right. So what we did is we spent a lot of time. I come from a market analysis background. When I had kids, I wanted a job where it didn't matter if I was three a.m. or three in the afternoon that I was working. Right, I was learning and contributing, and so I spent a ton of time doing market analysis. I would analyze whether we should buy companies, add features, you know, what our competitors are saying, and so that was cool. Coming into the campaign strategy is that's where we started. So we would take a look at market. We would take a look at where we thought things were going. We would take a look at where our our um, customers were not getting information, what they needed. And that's, you know, where we began. And then we spent some time taking a look at a few hypotheses on market positions. And we went out and we interviewed customers across the globe. And it was just very open interviews. Maybe I talked 10% of it just to kind of structure things and listened. And 
the more we talked to customers, the more we heard that, you know, digital transformation was a big theme for them. Right. And everyone was talking about digital transformation in the exact same language. And actually, it was shocking. Well, maybe not so much if you've been in the industry for a while. Going into Mobile World Congress, the degree of sameness everywhere, right? You know, same words. You can do a word cloud and it ends up being the same. It ends up looking the same. And then we ended up also talking about it on a more human perspective. And what we find is that people are crunched by time. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is, you know, in a personal life and work life, that's not going to change. The data and information flowing at us is going to continue to expand. And the expectation on us to start moving faster with a technology curve is going to continue. And so when we were looking at our campaign, it's really those themes that started ringing out loud and true, right? We're going digital, Mm-hmm. Right. And there is a digital time expectation that we're going to accelerate. Right. So how do you do it? And we're trying to pair those two things, that digital, that notion of time. And how do you use technology to make more better use of your time? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God. I, I, I'm i always really um, blown away that like when I started in my career uh, 20 years ago, it's like I don't it wasn't this busy we had less technology there was the internet there's all this stuff it was all emerging there was a lot to learn it wasn't that there was like it was pen and paper (laughs) but it was but i had way more time i had way more breathing space yes for everything Mm -hmm. like a strategy like if i went sat down with a client and they were like we need a strategy great um you know, I'm going to do my research, my due diligence, and put it together. Like, I'll be back to you in six weeks. I might have some questions in between. Great. Oh, that's a that's a miracle I'd get from a client. Uh. Years ago on, that became like more and more compressed. Then six weeks is like, really? Why is it taking that long? We that's right. You get the weekend today. You know, yeah. kind of thing. It's uh, it's almost like the part of that is the expectations. I guess that digital because digital's instant. It's at our fingertips. That the, the time becomes so. Uh, compressed, and I would imagine it's also going towards the problem that you talked about earlier, where, uh, like, with marketing and 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 thinking every about everything in that short termism kind of lens, right. where it's you want results right away rather than thinking about that longer term investment in those relationships. You know, I've got to say that is the one great thing about the shift that we did to this campaign strategy is we had that time up front to go work through the campaign strategy. But I have to tell you, as someone who likes to move at a a reasonable clip, it felt so painful (laughs) because, you know, you felt like, oh, my goodness, what are we getting out, you know, and what are people seeing and how much are we marketing? And that's why when you take a look at the organization and moving everyone over to a new model really quickly, right, there is a void Mm -hmm. that happens while you take the time to do the planning. The other cool thing about deciding that you're going to go with a campaign strategy is for the first time we started to really take a look at a broad range and mix of activities over a a 12 to 24 month period, which allowed us to do things like future rhythmic, which, you know, that's not going to be producing results on the first month. Right. Right. We're looking at something longer term. Yeah. 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 And, And speaking of which, like, so future rhythmic, for those of you that are listening, that may not know this, uh, the way that, uh, truly and Nokia came together was to create uh, this publication um, around a documentary series. So it was first and foremost a documentary series um, with uh, Michael Hainsworth, who's the host of it, as well as uh, the brainchild behind it, interviewing some big, as he calls them, big brains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really amazing people uh, like uh, Galit Ariel. And- She's amazing. Yeah, and Cory Doctorow, et cetera. And then, who's also Canadian. Um, <laughs> and uh, and actually, I b- based my first book on one of his um, books. Cool. Yeah. Um, so there, there was the series, and then we got involved when it came time to be like, how do we make this more impactful? Like, make sure that people w- see the videos, like, beyond just paying for views yeah. like how do like how does this transfer from seeing all the way through to a relationship 
and a or deepening or being built with Nokia. And that's where, you know, Future Rhythmic um, came out of. And it was kind of an interesting process. It was a ve- it was like, I think you guys took a major leap of faith. <laughs> with, with yeah, and we're, we're still proving the concept in internally, yeah. right? So it is. It's, it's a bit of a, a risk. But I feel directionally we're right. Yeah, with this one, and I just still continue to see so much potential with the with the platform because it's not just here's our widget and here's how it works, mm-hmm. right? We're getting at audiences that we were struggling to get before, yeah. And we're it was a two part thing. It's this is something that I've wanted to do for like four years or five. That it's almost like a Nike strategy. If Nike puts sneakers on great athletes. You know, Nokia wants to associate itself with some really smart people whose work is shaping the future. And that's what we've done. And they're topics that our customers are thinking about. Like augmented reality is going to touch every single one of them in multiple ways and forms in the next few years. So you have to start thinking about the strategy. And when we look at Sandy Pentland, when you take a look at privacy, data, trust, huge topics right now for our customers. And so if we get them thinking strategically, we get them thinking about things in different ways and opening a conversation, right, that's what we're after doing. And it's not just the show, it's the online platform, it's the podcast, it's a mix of things to keep them there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that. Uh, I think one of the like early learnings when we were putting together the strategy was all around, like, there's certain things that Nokia can say, yeah. right? Like, places that you can dip your toe, that Nokia on a Nokia-based publication can be like, here, this is what we think about things. Or Bell Labs, even Bell Labs can go a little further, deeper into the research that isn't necessarily tied to a specific product or whatever. But Futurismic gives, I think, uh, is gives like a, 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 a platform where like kind of those more fuzzy, a little bit kind of edgier questions can also be explored. Um, and in this idea of the future, whether it's privacy and data or uh, Internet of Things or augmented, all this stuff, there's like some big, hairy questions Absolutely. in all of this. And we're seeing this play itself out right now with the, you know, just yesterday, uh, the Facebook uh, co-founder, Chris Hughes, called for Facebook to be broken up and for Mark Zuckerberg to basically like have his power like lessened uh, by quite a bit. The most interesting thing to me in that was when he talked about the news algorithm hmm. and the potential that that had to be a major change on society. Like, think about that. Yeah. An algorithm... And the kind of impact that it had on the way we live, what we think, the news that we see. Yeah. And that's the world that we live in right now. And those are the kind of topics that, that we want to cover because folks are thinking about that in different ways. And, well, if they're not, right, they really should be. Well, in Facebook, I think is a very – it's like a – it is it is like the can- – not even a canary in a coal mine. It's like the, the coal mine collapsing, I guess, in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. But, they're, like, it is this – perfect example of what happens when you don't ask those questions early yeah. enough. Yeah. Asking those questions through like a, a Nokia blog or publication might be tricky because you're like, you have customers who We've are like, wait, you can't talk about that. But on Future Rhythmic, I think because we talk about, like it's about creating an editorial independence of sorts. Of course, we're supported by Nokia, but you don't come in and go, we can't say that. You come in and say, you know, like, you know. It's not in line with the brand position. Yeah, and that's it. But it's also, we can we can push it a lot right. further. And we have when we talk about things that, you know, like uh, one of the first articles that I published on there was around, uh, you know, telcos needing to step up when it came to um, robocalls. And I find it really interesting that, like, quickly after I started noticing a lot more articles on yeah. the same subject yeah. just bubbling oh, up. Oh, cool. I love yeah. that. And I was like, oh, all of a sudden everybody's talking about, uh, you know, robocalls and how, you know, we should start 
focusing more on that and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was one of the articles that um, one of, you know, the PR firm said was requested for one of the publications as well because it is a hot topic for the consumer, right? And so uh, it's not that telcos are sitting there with their hands in their pockets or anything. They're actually part of trying to find a solution. But... Like, that's also part of your customer base, right? Mm-hmm. If you're calling your customers to task on your own blog, it's a little bit trickier than than me, uh, you know, writer who's written an article from a consumer point of view who says, please, 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 tell yeah. us, stop these robocalls so I can, like, pick up my phone again without fear. <laughs> and, and, and that's actually funny. It's a conversation I had uh, with our staff today. I realized... We're three years in this agency. And we don't have phones in the office. Great. We, we, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and then like basically uh, like a half of the staff said it's like, well, we don't want to pick up any no, you know, like calls. No. Right. We just don't because it's mostly crap. Yeah. Right? So uh, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So um, yeah. All this to say, it's uh, you know, it's very. It's I, you may not always think so, but. We think that Nokia is an incredibly brave company and, you know, you guys are uh, just working with you. We ha- we constantly talk about how you're very agile for a huge, like, multi-company, country, like, I don't know how, how many employees, like, tens of thousands or whatever. You know, there's, like, so many you would never be able to tell by how agile you are, which is amazing. And and I think a big testament to how well your reorganization um, and the retooling and, and education has has gone. But it's also a pace that you guys set because um, what we appreciate is the scrappiness. You said that before. Um, you guys are coming back fast and responsive and the processes, because when we say like, you know, we're trying to reinvent and take a look at things. Sometimes we have certain things that just take forever to get out the door and the number of touches that we have on it. If anyone works at a big company, they totally get it, right? The number of people that have to touch it, approve it, go through. And, you know, you find that by the time you've got a press release out the door, you've got 20 revs. And if you actually stop and then put a cost on it. Yeah. people hours, time, all of those things, it ends up being a really bloody expensive thing to do. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is take a look at, like, you know, big companies want to be small, small companies want to be big. We're a big company that wants to make sure that our processes are a little bit more like a small company's. Yeah. And so there's certain things that we really like, for example, um, editorial process. Um, you guys have got a... a a really simple little tool for editorial. We've got a one-week editorial meeting where we sit down together and we look at the editorial agenda. Folks are able to say, okay, yep, here's an article idea. I'll assign this. Here's some people you can interview. Here's some topics. Here's some background. There's a pool of writers. You know, all the processes are automated in terms of when you got to go online, approve stuff. But that process works. We're getting content out the door faster than we do in other areas of the business. So we're taking that process and we're pulling it into a couple campaigns. We're grabbing someone like, you know, Angie to be our editorial, you know, director, but to, you know, direct the flow of it and also trying to limit some of those editorial processes. It's online. It's fairly simple, right? People know when they've got to read it and, you know, it goes through and it's not 50 people. Yeah. Very thin. Um, so we like... You know, taking some of those things because they make us faster. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because we take those things from other examples, right? So our editorial process actually comes from newsrooms. <laughs> like we learn from newsrooms who mm-hmm. are the, the like they, of course, they have a solid agile editorial process because for years, That's their business. for yeah. hundreds of years, they've had to put out news every day with a team of people like you assign it in the morning, you're you yeah. print it overnight. Like I'm constantly uh, amazed at how newsrooms work. And people think of like media companies and news newspapers as this old media, mm. but they like they've they've perfected something f- so beautiful over the yeah. years. Yeah, and I have to say, like one of the things that I noticed the way Tara and I sort of like look at or read uh, up on the industry or keep up to date. We don't keep up to date with what other 
uh, agencies, agencies are, are doing. doing now. Like we're not interested yeah. in what other agencies. Oh, you launched this awesome campaign. I don't know if you noticed, but we didn't really do a big PR push to say, "Hey, we're working with Nokia." Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like it, that. There's a lot of like you know insular sort of like taps on the back Ad in this age, industry, right? Blah, blah, blah. But what we pay attention to is is the publishing industry. We pay attention mm. to the the creators, right? Like I, I always sort of I feel like I'm a broken record, but like I spent many many years around you know DIY creators, people who who built their own brand online yeah. and have built you know massive audiences just in their living room. In their living room. But right? I love that. I know, I isn't it great? I love that, and I want to teach that to brands, yeah. Yeah. right? And I want them to understand that they don't need to to spend. Three million dollars to build an audience. They can be scrappy and sort of like slowly build it up the way. And I, I, I say creators, but a lot of the YouTubers that we we have friends that you know are you know millionaires because they decided to they decided to be scrappy like that. And then two three years in, they're like they're making seven figures a year just doing their own little thing. Yeah, running being, their own media their own, empire. Media, media empire, right? Without, they didn't have <laughs> Nokia budgets. They didn't have, yeah. you know, big agency budgets. They had them to do yeah. it. And we, we, that's why, you know, the company's scrappy, the way we want to build, we build audiences and yeah. campaigns scrappily and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, and you guys, will, you guys will debate us, right? Because I know like, oh, we, yeah. we, we, but no, but I love that, right? I don't want like a, a yes agency, right? right? Yeah, As I say, yeah. it comes back to, we want to learn. We had some really big decisions to make at the beginning about brand trade-offs you know mm. when you come back to you know is it nokia is it a nokia original how prominent is nokia how closely linked is nokia how do we make sure it serves the nokia brand and it's closely you know there were a lot of big discussions that go along those lines yeah and it, so for us, the big thing that came up was about being tried and true to the brand and what the brand stands for, you know, some consistency in, in the look and feel. And then what we're working pretty heavily on is how do you do the cross pollination and putting this into our salespeople's hands so it extends a, a conversation. But that was, again, to that whole scrappiness of the research and different approach and, and whatnot that helped us, you know, come to that position. Yeah, absolutely. And Will, we learned a lot in that process as well. It was good. You pushed us because we were like all here and then we took it there and then moved it back. It yeah, was, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it made it, it actually taught us a lot about, you know, working with brand uh, brand teams as yeah. well. We, your brand team is is great. They were wonderfully collaborative. I mean, of course, they have to protect the Nokia brand. They've worked so hard on like it's a multi billion dollar asset. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so uh, they were really wonderful at helping us, you know, walk through the process as well and uh, understand that. I mean, we don't come from brand backgrounds. Like we're more of a, audience. you know, yeah, we're more on the audience development side of things. And actually, I think I gained a lot more respect for. For for brand for branding, you know, um, brand managers and people who develop brands and in the idea of a brand again, which I had very much kind of in my internet webby geeky way been like meh, brand doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> like it's you know people are loyalty's dead all this stuff and then I'm like no actually I get it I get it now and so it's actually I learned a lot through that process too. It was it was cool. And then the other part that I thought was interesting from you guys is really that audience, uh, that research bit, that like the pretty comprehensive research before we got started. But you intrigued me with something that you said. I think it was when you were working on Justin Trudeau's campaign, taking a look at um, aboriginal issues yeah. and how those things surface early and the whole importance of listening so you oh, know yeah. when to talk and when to address an issue and i love this part of the platform it's not just the um you know put it up throw it up and um measure the results right yeah yeah, yeah. how many impressions did we get it if we really do this right Every month we're getting to know our audience more and more, what they like, what they read, what they care about. And in that process, we should be getting better. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, uh, so that's the cultural s studies person in me <laughs> who is like, you know, I learned, uh, you know, the, uh, how to do a anthropology political study of cultures. And for me, from the early days, I was always like, well, people are 
are printing their culture, are, are polishing their cultural taste, their 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 loves, their their hopes, their fears, everything, their dreams, that what's happening with them through every step of what they're doing, yeah, online, and in the early days of social, there was all this like, well, oh, here's another platform for us to push our message out. I was like, no, 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 you're missing the whole point of this. The best part of social is that people are telling you what they want. They're telling you what they don't want. They're telling you who they are so that you can actually get ahead of their needs and like impress the hell out of them. (laughs) Yeah. And you're not, you're instead, you're just pushing and listening for response on what you're pushing, not to your audience. So from an early, early, early days, I've been very much advocating this idea of bringing this, like, this idea of this digital anthropological point of view of, like, how can we create more of a holistic view of who your best customer is? Not just, like, you know, market demographic sort of stuff, but your best customer, that person who's going to, who, who, whether they know it or not, needs or is looking for your product, or maybe they don't even know they need it yet, but they're like, oh, actually, this thing that I've been hacking together for years, that could solve it. And that they have the desire, the the, the money to spend on that product. But a lot of people forget that uh, mm-hmm. when we see couponing over couponing uh, happening. That's like you're looking at the wrong audience because they're, they want a deal. And then the last is, then this is the social part, is they are talking to other people like them. So for your audience, for instance, you know, like you're wanting to tap into somebody who is more socially active, whether it's online or offline, who is going to conferences, who is uh, sharing articles, who is having Twitter chats or whatever it is that however they come together with people in their industry, because there's more of an opportunity for that person once you've won them over for them to say, Oh, you need to go look at Nokia. They're they're who you should be working with. You know, like they're going to help amplify everything that you're doing because of that. So for me, from early on, that's been like a, that's a no-brainer. Of course we should be doing this. But it's been like 20 years of me beating on that drum. And I finally am hearing more and more um, acknowledgement of this in general in the industry and more and more, I think, because a lot of people found, like, through their push to a f- marketing efficiency, right? <laughs> that, oh, wait and a minute. That's live and well, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wait a minute. This isn't working as as well as we, you know, we were promised or used to. Well, um, now, okay, maybe we should listen to what people are saying. Because people are still there. Like, people say, oh, it's, all this stuff is dead. It's not. People are still fundamentally want to connect with other people like them online. That's who we are as human beings. And when do you enter a conversation? I think that that's especially in tech. Yeah. Mm. When you start taking a look at at trends, you want to be early to enter the conversation and to shape, you know, some of the thinking or at least come in with a point of view or ability to have a discussion. Yeah. And I think that ability to to listen and make sure that you're on things and responding quickly is is a big part of the equation. You look at anybody who we're calling influencers, I'm throwing yep. up air quotes, and that those are the people that were there early beating on drums in, in these conversations. Those are the people that uh, now companies are like, can we give you a whole bunch of money to speak about our pro- product it's not because they're they're not influential because like they set out to be influential they're influential because they had something to to say and they also got into these conversations with people like i'm always amazed at like the i you know meet new people all all the time on on various social channels whether it's linkedin or twitter and i'm not on facebook as much anymore but like through all of these channels i meet new people all the time who it starts out with you know, them just jumping into a conversation and adding value in a conversation. And then it moves into like, okay, I'll follow them. And then they're saying some really smart things. And then I'm retweeting. And the next thing you know, like that person um, is speaking alongside me at a conference, right? And they is because they're contributing something to a conversation first and foremost before they ask for anything back. And I think companies need to 
to operate in the same way, give something of value. And that's, you know, um, yeah, no. you start off with that question. How yeah. can I help? How yeah. can I add value? Yes. And that's, I think, the, the, the basis probably of the audience centric approach yeah. um, is not how can I get out value, but how can I add value? Yeah, and to do that, we have to think about it differently. I'm thinking about, Carlos, the the point that you raised about people sitting in their living rooms with multi-million dollar businesses. Yeah. You know, so the way that we're packaging the content, the way we're looking at the series is much different than something that we would have done 15 years ago. I was cleaning out my desk drawers the other day, and I had one of the first newsletters that I published. It's beautiful, glossy, folded, looks like a paper, but like, I mean, can you even imagine that right now? Mm-hmm. I might work in a hipster world. Yeah, Yeah, there you go. Okay, there you go. That's right. It's Metro. Bring it back. But I mean, even like, you know, on Future Rhythmic, the video, the process of learning is just amazing because my son, who's 15 year old, who's constantly watching videos, you know, when we get rough cuts of them, he'll sit next to me. And I remember like, you know, one night um, we're, we're hanging out and he's quiet for a little bit after watching it. And then he sits up and he's like, mom, let me tell you what the problem with that is. But, he's the, but the point of view is great. Like He consumes so many videos, and now he's constantly pinging with me on, hey, check out this video series. I really love the approach to animations. You see how they're setting up the problem here, mm. right? And the thinking from him is fresh, and I can't just dismiss it. It's like no. this 15-year-old, but the Does advice is great. <laughs> oh, my God, yes, he does. Because we're uh, always looking for... That's right, he needs a new phone. Amazing. You know? <laughs> that's what he needs. There <laughs> is... Awesome. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I don't want to make this too long, but I do want to ask you about also, uh, apart from Nokia, now into a book. You're Okay, not only are you like changing this huge behemoth of a company into like this amazing agile you know, um, the massive team. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, massive like, team. You know, like, you know, your voice. Not just me. <laughs> but, it's, but it's a pretty big job. You're also been doing a lot of research, um, uh, and you are working on a book. Now I don't know if the, is this a working title because it's it. a working title. Could That's I right, we're testing it for sure. It's your <clears throat> podcast; you get to decide. I love this title: "How to Stop Bullshit Conversations and Get Stuff Done." Okay, our podcast just became R-rated. Oh. <laughs> well, you can just you get an E now. You can say it's for excellent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when I read the abstract, it's very different than I kind of imagined from the title but it makes perfect sense all the way through it's um more about and what i loved about it because it once again from a researcher of human like the qualitative type of resource re- research not the quantitative type of research more you're talking about soft skills yeah and how much they're going to matter into the future can you tell us a little bit more about this, the research that you've been doing and, and the book that is emerging? Sure. So I, the way that I learn is by researching, writing, and teaching. And so I teach a lot of different courses, and my background is communications. So I've taught a long time on how to create stories, how to stand up and present. Um, I've done a lot of work on gender. And this actually started off as a book on gender. Huh. But as I started to get into the topic and, and talking to people, I saw something different. Guys are getting tired of you know being told right that this is how they have to act. Women are getting exhausted with leaning in. <laughs> But across the board, what we see is we come into a world that's AI, we're time starved, is the need to have better conversations faster. And it really hit me once when we were having this meeting. I sat down, it was an R&D team, I was asked to come on in and, and work with the group. And these are people who'd worked together for a long time. And like the meeting was just going nowhere. I was shocked that people weren't on the same pages for stuff that I assume was fairly obvious. And, you know, I kind of wrote off pretty fast that this is going to be a waste of time. And when you work in large corporations, right, you see meetings like this regularly or conference calls like this where you have multiple people on the phone and it's a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> and. The problem with this is, is that we have to collaborate, we have to get on the phone, we have to meet way more often than we used to. Mm -hmm. And that's only going to accelerate. The demands on our time are going to get bigger. So we have to get better at having a conversation. And I watched during this meeting a new guy come on in, and I think he was clearly going through the same process that I was going through, that this is going to be a waste of time. And instead of sitting back and saying, okay, check my my watch, he started taking over. 
you know, he started driving decisions, driving an agenda, checking, tabling, but it was a set of skills. So much so that I asked him about it on the break. I'm like, you changed that meeting. And he looked at me and he goes, you know, Heather, I've because I learned how. The last team that he was with decided that the way that they meet, the way that they work together is so important because it's about building trust, building a methodology for how you communicate. And at that point, you're able to operate with speed. And so they sat down with a business psychologist and they went through like on a group level how you communicate. They went through on individual level how you communicate. And, you know, that led me to call the business psychologist they work with. And then it's calling a bunch of other people. And so we start taking a look at technology moves on the speed of Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. And it's accelerating so fast. As we come into the world of augmented intelligence, computers are going to take over way more than, than they had before. But what jobs are they going to take over? Stuff where computers are better. It's computational stuff, analysis stuff. What are humans going to do? That's and humans are going to have to, yeah, there you go. But humans are going to have to do the jobs that humans do best. And that's really, it's the social, emotional stuff. Mm -hmm. And the demand for those skills is just going to continue to grow. So we need to start taking our soft skills on the kind of growth curve that we see technology on. And tech can help us. And so that's that's the topic of the book. And amazing. along the journey, I've met like just amazing people who are doing some pretty cool things with tech and pretty good things with their team. And it's meant to be like a little bit of a how-to. Yeah, amazing. Well, I can't wait for it to come out when you have a... I, where are you at? Are you like in editing to publish or are you still I'm gathering? still in draft yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I won't pressure you having written a book. <laughs> I, I won't <laughs> put pressure on you. I understand how long that can take, especially when you're also in a full-time job. But I really love that. And I love like I can see why it started out gendered because quite often soft skills are associated with women. Well, you know what's actually really cool is I've sat through a bunch of research where, you know, we're always teaching women to be more like men, yeah. be more analytical. And I love the irony in as we go and we do that research and we look at the difference between um, what computers are going to do and what people are going to do, those skills, those relationship oriented skills that are not valued as much in a boardroom, you know, that are you know, women are getting trying to coach out of it. What we're finding is going forward, those skills are going to be way more valuable than they were in the past. All right, we're eliminating men. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I, and no, I think, I'm, I'm yeah. completely joking. Yeah. And I'm very <laughs> no, no, no. happy about that situation. <laughs> well, and I mean, even, even uh, you know, we're, uh, we're our relationship. We're, yeah, uh, our, our relationship, relationship and our, our working relationship as well as our relationship relationship. Um, you know, uh, Carlos, uh, and I'm, I hope you're okay with me saying this on the podcast, oh. but you've evolved emotionally a lot since yeah. we started when, for, since we first met, he's. I'm a, I'm I'm attracted to very smart and very you know someone who can make me a better man. That's always what I said. Oh, yeah. So he's he's like picking man. an agency yeah, and picking yeah, a spouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, got to learn exactly. from them. Yeah, but exactly. actually true. Yeah, <laughs> but like he, you know, it, he's a he's a Portuguese man, and it's not just Portuguese. There's a lot of sort of old European, European men, yeah. first generation, and, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, very closed uh, descendants and, and yeah. all that sort of stuff. And so you have this sort of like men do not cry men do not show emotions when the women start to talk chatter in their like social banter <laughs> stuff walk out of the room you know yeah. kind of i watch his dad do it <laughs> so yeah just just to say that now i cry a lot no <laughs> all right yeah. that's good but, he's, but definitely i've watched uh him be more in touch with his emotions which has made him actually a lot better at what he does which i like he would be a good case study <laughs> Uh, in his evolution as well from being like I have to sort of hold cards to my chest to now I'm much better at being in touch with what the person across from me is feeling and, and responding to that, you know, and I'm much better in touch with um, like just even myself in the way that I'm feeling and being able to express myself in that moment, mm -hmm. um, which is, is pretty amazing. So so that's the journey, right? Yeah. Like as we become more technology focused, right? It's that <laughs> gift about being our quirky human selves, right? That is what's different. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much yes. uh, for 
coming in and being part of this pleasure. conversation. Um, as like we t- sat down ahead of time, we're like, let's just talk. Um, <laughs> I think it worked out pretty well. I love what uh, you know what you're studying here. I also. Everything that you guys have done with Nokia fits right into that idea of, of what we're trying to promote too. Yeah, and uh, tell uh, tell the audience where where how people should like you know make sure they don't miss out when the book's ready. Like, do you have like a mailing list? Do you have a uh, you know is it gonna be like, just follow, follow you on, on LinkedIn? Yeah, just follow on on LinkedIn. Yeah, okay. I've got to take a page out of your book and start doing more of my own content. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, is the well, one. we've been we've been uh, prodding you to do. I, I mean, I was looking at your abstract. I was like, this would be a good uh, futurismic. Uh, All right, article. you know what? There you have it. Mm-hmm. This art, this abstract makes for an amazing article on futurismic. So let's do that. All right. Uh, so look on futurismic.com very soon for uh, Heather's new column. Um, <laughs> okay, you know what? We'll it needs to be. No, no, that's great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. It's great to hang out. Thank you very much, Heather, for coming on the show. This was uh, a real treat for us. It was totally mind-blowing. I love the research that Heather is doing, and I hope that, uh, well, I I try to encourage her now to do more writing and get more of her research out there before she goes to publish her uh, book. But when she does publish her books, we will make sure that we promote it here as well. So... So follow us here if you want to hear more and find out when Heather publishes. And you could really help us out by giving us a positive rating on Apple Podcasts. Thank you very much. Have a good one.